So where is everything? Lecture six. What's our goal today? Our goal today is boundedness of the dube maximal operator that I introduced on Tuesday. Boundedness of dube's maximal operator. And from that, we're going to, well, we're not going to do the proof, but I'm going to tell you the result. From that, we're going to get pointwise convergence. of the martingale associated with a function and a filtration, which is given by taking the conditional expectation along the filtration of some function. Pointwise convergence of that to the limiting conditional expectation, which is just F itself, if the limiting sigma algebra A infinity is the sigma algebra A that we start with. If the filtration is rich enough to have all of the information of the sigma algebra that we want to get in the limit. But before we can do that, we need to talk about stopping times because I forgot to define them earlier. Well, I didn't actually forget. I, I skipped them earlier because I thought, let's put that off. Now we're gonna have to do it. And to be fair, we don't really need much of a, a theory of stopping times. We just need the definition and we need this one particular class of stopping times. We need to know that this one particular class is a class of stopping times. And we're gonna use that in the proof of boundedness of the dube maximal operator. And yeah, if you know probability, you already know this. And if you don't, then you don't. So we're given a probability space and a filtration. And what's our definition? A random variable, which we'll call T, and which will be valued in the natural numbers including infinity, so the extended natural numbers. Such a random variable is called a stopping time with respect to the filtration. If the following condition is satisfied, if for all n, the set of points in the probability space for which the random variable is less than or equal to n, this has to be in the sigma algebra a n. This is the definition of a stopping time. What this means in words is that at time n, you know whether or not t is less than or equal to n. t is a random variable. You think that there's some underlying probability space omega, which is the, the dice that God is playing with, and you have some outcome. And at time n, you'll know whether this outcome is less than or equal to n. Where there's that, okay, that probably didn't help that explanation. Every time I try to explain stopping times to somebody, I think I managed to make it more confusing. <laughs> If the probabilists have a better explanation that they want to give now, now's your chance. <laughs> but, uh, is there a reason why one writes this with smaller or equal to n and not just takes the pre-image of n? Um, it would be equivalent because of a, it's a filtration. So if knowing whether or not t is equal to n at time n, at the previous time n minus 1, you know whether or not it was equal to n minus 1. Right. No, no, my question was, is oh. there like some, some motivation of writing in, in that way? Because I would say notation wise, T inverse of N would have been quicker. So I thought probably there's Good a point. reason why one wants to <laughs> think about it in this way. I see no reason not to do it that way. I mean, you can write T inverse of N or you can write T inverse of the set zero one dot 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 N. Yeah. These are all going to be equivalent conditions. Okay, so there's and maybe there's this no, is a better way of writing it. <laughs> there's no particular reason why it should be why one would should think about it as okay. Thank you. No, no, it's, it's just a matter of notation. You can think about it whichever way you think is better. In yeah, continuous time, it's important. In continuous time, it's important. Well, oh we're, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, 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 yeah, like it's a stopping time if it's less than or equal to. It's also an optional. It's called an optional time if it's strictly and it's like 
it, there's a difference in continuous time, but we don't care about that. It's the same that thing. Is a good point. Yeah, no, that's yeah. completely right. Yeah, because I'm only doing discrete time processes. A lot of the technicalities that come up in stochastic processes sort of disappear. Continuous time is a bit funny because yeah, if you made it just less than n instead of less than or equal to n, they wouldn't be equivalent anymore. Yeah, it depends a lot on the form your random variable takes and the form your filtrations take and all of that. But we don't have to worry about any of that stuff because we stick with discrete time. Good. That's that's exactly why I did it that way, and I knew from the beginning. <laughs> Let's say that. So the one example that we really have to work with, back in the context of our, our betting game that we've been doing for the last couple of days, flipping a coin, betting on vectors. So remember, we flip a coin every step, we have a vector, we bet a vector every step, and if we get heads, we win that vector, and if we get tails, we lose that vector. So we have a, a wallet S, and we add or subtract the vector according to whether we win or lose. Let's suppose our goal, supposing we have a goal in this game, is to get our wallet S into a fixed Borel set K in the Barnack space. So let's suppose we're saving up for some sort of Barnack valued car or something. And the cost of this Barnack valued car is that your wallet has to be in a certain fixed Borel set. And we want to gamble until we have that X valued amount of money. None of this really makes sense if you don't have an order on your Barnack space, but you know, this is theoretical, so that's okay. So suppose we want to get our wallet into a fixed Borel set and then just stop betting. By that, I mean just bet the zero vector from then on. So we want to get to a certain point and then stop. This is why it's called a stopping time. This would be a stopping condition, our wallet being in the set K. So what does all this mean in the context of, of stopping times? We're gonna define a random variable T sub K. And this will be the, well, I'm writing in FEMA, I'm using the language from continuous time, but you could say minimum equally well here, the infimum of n such that your wallet is in the set k at time n. And just to make a note here, what we have is that tk of omega is finite. Oh no, I want to say infinite, not finite, is infinite if your wallet is never actually in k. Standard convention, the infimum of an infinite set is infinity. Maybe that's why I don't write minimum. <laughs> that makes sense. So this random variable tk is the first time at which uh, the wallet sn is in k. So let's say you flip the coin, you bet some vectors, and at time 10, you're finally within the set k. Then maybe you leave the set k for a bit and come back and whatever. S TK of this particular omega, this particular instance of the game would be 10 because that's the first time you ended up in the set K. Now this random variable T sub K should be a stopping time because it matches our intuition of what a stopping time is. We should at time N, we should know whether or not our wallet's been in K before time N or including time N. And indeed we do know that but we should write out the proof. Not that it's particularly difficult. So we want to show that this set here is in the sigma algebra a n, right? So let's just write out the definition. M such that S M omega is in K. This infimum has to be less than or equal to n by the definition of the random variable. What does this mean if the infimum of n such that this condition holds is less than or equal to n? It means that the condition holds for some m less than or equal to n. So the wallet at time m is in k for some 
time m less than or equal to n. This is equivalent to the, the minimum of such times being less than n. And when you have a set of this form, this condition holds for some parameter m, this is just a union of sets. This is the union of m from zero to n of the inverse image at time m of k. Yep. Now, every one of these sets here is in AM because A, well, because the process S is A adapted, which I think we mentioned on Tuesday or something like that. All of these pre-images are AM measurable and AM is contained in AN because we're looking at M less than or equal to N and A is a filtration. So this whole union here being a finite union of sets in AN and AN being a sigma algebra, this is in AN. So this set on the left here is AN measurable or in AN. Therefore, T sub K is a stopping time with respect to A. Now I realize I forgot to say what A was. A is the filtration generated by the coin flips which I mentioned in the last lecture probably. And what we're using is that S is A adapted, which I also mentioned last time. And these are the important assumptions that you need for, for this random variable to be a stopping time. Because of course this holds much more generally, I'm gonna phrase it as a proposition, but what I've just shown here is the proof just with a particular choice of stochastic process. It's a proposition. Given your probability space and a Banach space and a stochastic process. So Banach valued stochastic process adapted to our filtration, which we call a dot. And given a Borel set K in the Barnack space, then the random variable T sub K, which we defined as before, I'll write it out again in this full generality. Infimum of n such that f sub n of omega is in k. This random variable here is a stopping time with respect to the filtration a. So at time n, you know whether or not the random variable is less than or equal to n. And yeah, as I said, the proof is exactly the proof up here, replacing the wallet process S with the process F and everything goes through. It's a simple proof. It's a little bit more complicated when you go to continuous time, as we were saying before, but in discrete time, it's nice and simple. I think you probably need more continuity conditions or something like that. I'm not sure what you need in continuous time, but let's not worry about that. Right. So that's really all we need to know about stopping times. There's a whole theory. There's a lot more you can say about them, but this is all we need. So let's recall what the dude maximal operator was. This thing that we want to, to show is bounded. It acts on a stochastic process F bullet, which is valued in some space X, valued in a Barnack space X, of course. And it's defined like this, the maximal function of F bullet at the point omega is just the supremum over N of the norm of the process at time N. 
like that. And what we need to note about this, well, one of the things we need to note about this is that this is non-negative. I mentioned that last week, last lecture, sorry, this week. So this is essentially a scalar object. You take your vector valued process, but then you immediately just take the norms. So you're really just taking the, in a sense, I'll write it in a different color. You're really just taking the, the maximal operator of this process here, this pointwise norm process. So essentially all of the theory of this operator is corresponding to the theory of scalar valued processes. There's nothing really Barnack space geometric about this. So we're gonna make a definition so that we can just consider only scalar things in the following proof. Given all of the things we are usually given, probability space, filtration, and let's consider a real valued process, a real valued stochastic process, F bullet, such that Fn is integrable for all n, is called a sub-martingale rather than a martingale, a sub-martingale with respect to a field, well, with respect to the filtration A bullet. If instead of the usual martingale condition where Fn is the conditional expectation with respect to An of Fn plus one, you have that Fn is less than or equal to that conditional expectation. Almost everywhere. I don't remember if I said almost everywhere in the definition of a martingale, but I should have. Now we can, we can make this comparison. We can use this less than or equal to because we're only considering real valued processes here. We couldn't do this in a general Barnack space. We could only formulate equality. We can't do these comparisons. What this means is that rather than the process being balanced, you expect to, to gain something at each step. So if you're at step N, your best approximation for what's going to happen at the next step is actually larger than where you're currently at or equal to. So this is a game that if you're playing the game, you kind of expect to win it. Or if you're administering the game, you expect to lose it. It depends on your perspective, whether you are the player or the casino, right? Incidentally, if you know PDE, you've got harmonic functions and subharmonic functions and superharmonic functions and so on. And this is the analog of subharmonic function here, right? So what do I want to say about this key example? If you take an X valued martingale, which are the objects we really care about, then if you take this pointwise norm process, this is a non-negative sub martingale. which is not hard to show. It just comes from the, um, what does it come from? It comes from the fact that conditional expectations, well, they just behave this way. <laughs> I've got in the notes a more thorough proof of that. I don't remember this being particularly difficult, but it, um, my mind has gone blank for the moment. I can't think of the short explanation for this. I'm sure one of you knows what it is. Is it Janssen's inequality? I think it's Janssen's inequality. That's the one. <laughs> It's, um, yeah, Jensen's inequality. The norm is nice and convex or concave or whichever one it is, and that behaves well with integrals. You can put norms inside integrals. That's all it is. Yeah, the norm of an integral is less than or equal to the integral of the norm. You use that and the definition of the conditional expectation. Or Jensen's inequality, if you look at it that way. That's a bit more general. I didn't state Jensen's inequality for conditional expectations. It is true, though. Conditional expectations behave like integrals. They have a Jensen's inequality associated with them, but I don't think you need to know all of that. Yeah, so the only non the only sub-martingales we really care about are these ones that come from Barnack-valued martingales. 
we don't really need the full theory of sub martingales, although there is one, of course, but not for not for Barnack valued stuff because you don't have that comparison to work with. The reason I introduce sub martingales is that they're the natural situation, the natural context in which to prove the boundedness of the dude maximal operator. We're going to do that for real non-negative sub martingales. You don't need the non-negativity assumption, but we're going to assume it because in practice we always have it. So yep, just remember the definition of a sub martingale. It's like a martingale, but with a less than or equal to instead of inequality. So let's do Dube's theorem, one of Dube's theorems. We're given a probability space and a filtration and a non-negative sub martingale. And of course, this is real valued. As I said before, but a little bit too quickly, this non-negativity assumption is not necessary, but it just makes the proof a little bit simpler. And all of the sub martingales we ever consider are non-negative because they're norms of Barnack valued martingales. Okay. What do we have for all T greater than zero? We have the following estimate here. We take the probability that the, the maximal operator is greater than T and we multiply it by T. This will be less than or equal to the supremum over N of the integral of Fn over the set where the maximal operator is greater than T. And we also have that for all p between one and infinity, not including endpoints, although this is true for the endpoint infinity as well. I just didn't write it for some reason. The LP norm of the maximal function is less than or equal to the supremum over n of the LP norm of Fn with a constant, and this constant is p prime, hold a conjugate of p. So if p equals one, I guess I could still write that this was true for p equals one because p prime is infinity in that case. And then this is automatically true. <laughs> but you don't consider it as holding for p equals one because then you're not saying anything. So for p greater than one, you have an LP norm estimate, but the constant blows up as p approaches one. For p equals one, this is what's called a weak one one estimate or a weak type one one. For those who did Christoph's harmonic analysis course, I think you know what this is. And I'll come back to that later on when I talk about a corollary. So this is the, or a basic form of Dube's maximal inequality. And we're gonna prove it using stopping times. What do you call a stopping time argument? In harmonic analysis, one always talks about stopping time arguments, but one doesn't always learn what a stopping time actually is. Now you know what a stopping time is. All right. So let's start by fixing T. Why not? And we define a random variable, which is going to be a stopping time, of course. Define a random variable t as follows t omega is the infimum of n for which fn of omega is greater than t. I forgot to introduce some notation before. We usually write oh yeah, t sub k, I introduced that. This is t sub the subset the interval from t to omega. I forgot to say what this is called. This is called the first heating time of the set k. I better say that tk is the first heating time of k. So we're just taking the first heating time of the interval from t to infinity. 
And given the definition of the maximal operator up here, where did I put it? Ah, it's all the way up. Uh, sorry. Hang on, I've gone too far, haven't I? No, it's here, yeah. Given the definition of this maximal operator, you're looking at the, the largest value of, of Fn. It kind of makes sense to define the stopping time. So looking at the first time it gets above a certain threshold. I guess, yeah, this makes sense if you think about it the right way. So T is a stopping time with respect to A because the sub-martingale F is a sub-martingale with respect to A and I didn't mention that. And in particular, it's A adapted. So I take these hitting times associated with this process. They're going to be stopping times with respect to the same sigma algebra. All right. Let's try to make less of a mess of this proof than I already have. Let's compute the, the probability that we need to compute. So what's the first step? The first step is to realize that the set where the maximal operator or the maximal function of f is greater than t is exactly the set of omegas such that, well, just first by definition, it's a set of omegas such that the supremum of n of f of n omega is greater than t. And here we're already using implicitly that f is non-negative, f dot is non-negative because otherwise we would need to have an absolute value here. And that would make the proof slightly more complicated, but we don't need that. So first that was just, that was the definition of the maximal operator to rewrite the set. And now we rewrite this in terms of the stopping time. This is the set of omega for which T of omega is finite. T of omega being finite means that for some N T of uh, F of N, f sub n of omega is greater than t. The supremum over all of these being greater than t says that one of the values has to be greater than t. If f n of omega is never greater than t, so this condition here, if that condition fails, then, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. If the maximal operator is less than or equal to T, then the stopping time is infinite because the stopping condition is never satisfied. Not so easy to explain in words. Look at the math and think about it. So now we can write this as a limit as N goes to infinity. Sum from N, from small N from zero to capital N of t times the probability that the random variable t is equal to n. Because if the random variable t is less than infinity, then it's equal to n for some n. So we might as well sum over all those possibilities. And rather than writing it as an infinite series, we're going to write it as a limit of finite series like that. And I'm not going to bother writing omega every time because it just gets a bit too, takes too long. Now on this set, on the set where t equals n, what does it mean for t to be equal to n? It means exactly that t is less than fn of omega. That's the definition of the random variable t, capital T, I should say. So we can write this t times probability here as being less than or equal to, write all the stuff out the front, the integral over the set t equals n. And instead of integrating t, we integrate fn because t is less than fn on this set. So next we use the fact that fn is a sub-martingale, or f is a sub-martingale, so fn is less than or equal to almost everywhere the conditional expectation on an of fn plus one. 
And if you induct actually, so we've got a capital N here, which is greater than N. So I can replace N plus one with capital N there. And this will be true too. This is in one of the exercises about fundamental properties of martingales, which I told you to do and which you should have done by now. So your fault if you don't know this result. So let's write that out. So we're still integrating over t equals small n, but now we have the conditional expectation of f capital N. And we're gradually making this integrand not depend on small n, it's kind of what's happening here. So now since capital T is a stopping time, this set here where t equals n, this is in sigma algebra a n. And yeah, we could have defined it, the stopping condition, the definition of a stopping time to use equality instead of less than or equal to, right? Because that's what we're actually going to use here. This set here is in a n, and we're integrating a conditional expectation with respect to a n on a set in a n. So we use the definition of conditional expectations and we remove the conditional expectation from that. So this is conditional using the conditional expectation property. I wanted to write that in red, but my tablet wouldn't let me. So what can we do now? Now the integrand doesn't depend on small n at all. Only the set that we integrate over depends on n. And we look, we're integrating over the set where t equals small n and we're summing this over small n. So now we can remove the sum. We keep this limit out the front though. Integrate over the set where t is less than or equal to capital N of Fn. And what can we do now? We can look at this thing here without the limit. And we can say that this is less than or equal to the supremum over all M of the integral of FM over the set where the maximal operator or the maximal function of F is greater than T because again, that's the set where capital T is less than infinity. So when we take the limit over all n of this thing, which is n independent, we find in the end that this probability we wanted to estimate has the estimate that we wanted. So remember this was the left-hand side. We kind of went a few steps down and probably forgot what the left-hand side was. Here it is. The left-hand side is less than or equal to the supremum of these integrals of f of fm, which was the right-hand side that we wanted. It's a nice proof. Uh, it uses ideas that are not too deep, but that are quite powerful. Conditional expectations, conditional expectation property, this sub-Martingale property that appears in this inequality here. It's, it's a great proof. I think Doob probably came up with this proof originally, right? I mean, it's attributed to Doob. He was probably the first because he kind of invented everything to do with martingales. If it wasn't Doob, it was Livy, right? It's probably Doob. So that's the first result we needed. We also have this LP estimate. And if you know interpolation, which I know half of you probably do, we've proven a weak type one, one estimate. And because it's a maximal operator, there's trivially an L infinity estimate sitting behind it. And from that, you can get LP estimates and you're done. If you know the real interpolation method or if you know the Martinkiewicz interpolation theorem. But I'm gonna assume you don't know that and we're gonna prove the LP estimate directly. Incidentally, this proof uses the exact same idea as you'd use in proving the Martinkiewicz interpolation theorem. So if you know this proof, you can do real interpolation. So now we fix P between one and infinity. And we want to show that the LP norm 
of the maximal function is bounded by P prime times the supremum over N of the LP norm of Fn. I heard something happen there. I don't know if that was a question or somebody just unmuted themselves. Was that a question? I guess not. Okay. We're going to fix an epsilon and we're going to use the result above in a clever way. The result that we just proved. For sufficiently large n, we have that the left-hand side, I should also, and fix T, sorry. For sufficiently large n, I got that the left-hand side is pretty close to the right-hand side without the supremum. Actually, this right-hand side is increasing in M. So this supremum is actually a limit as M goes to infinity. And basically you pick N large enough that you get close enough to that supremum. It's called saturating a supremum. If you don't know that terminology, we saturate the supremum. And now what do we do? Let's estimate the LP norm. And let's take the peak power just to simplify things. And there's this nice clever representation of an LP norm to the peak power, which looks like this. And you've probably seen it before. DT. People have seen that before, right? This is taking the LP norm, but looking at measures of level sets rather than looking at the, the values of the function itself. This should have been done in every measure theory course you've done. If it hasn't, this holds in general for general LP spaces over general measures. You can integrate over zero to infinity and look at the super level measures here. It's pretty important. If you don't know it, go home and study it or stay home as you probably are and study it there. Um, and I should probably be careful here because it looks like I've chosen N depending on T. And I would like to take N independent of T here. And I've only just noticed this issue now. I might have to go back in the notes and fix that. So let's pretend for now that N does not depend on T. This is probably fine, but let's just ignore this technicality for the moment. Do the proof as if n was independent of t. It can probably be made independent of t. I don't see why not. Doesn't matter. We can take limits. We can do this integral from, say, epsilon to infinity, prove it, and then get something independent of epsilon. We fix that later on. We have the estimate for this super level measure here. So we'll use that. And we're going to lose a power of P here, a power of T, because we have this T that appears here. Uh, Fn dP, I'm gonna write the omegas in, dT. And now we use Fabini because whenever you have a, a double integral that appears, you should always use Fabini immediately because it always works. We now integrate over all of omega and we integrate from T up to the value of the maximal operator of P, T to the P minus two DT put that in a bracket, then integrate in omega. And this integral in T, we can evaluate it directly because we know how to integrate powers of T. So first we just write out everything. We're going to get a P on P minus one because we have a T to the P minus two and a P. 
let's put in the fn and then this upper limit here will appear to the power p minus one. And you think back to high school when you learned how to do these integrals, presumably, and you see that this is correct. Now, p on p minus one is p prime by definition. That's where the p prime comes from. And we use Helder on this integral. We get one plus epsilon p prime LP norm of Fn, which is what we want times LP prime norm of what's left over. So for P minus one power of the maximal function, LP prime norm using what Helder conjugates, well, using that Helder conjugates work for Helder's inequality. That's how you define them. And if you rewrite this thing here, you get one plus epsilon P prime Fn LP norm and you get the LP norm of the maximal operator to the power P minus one. Because if you take in here, you take like an integral of whatever to the P prime times P minus one. P prime is P on P minus one. So this becomes P. So you're getting an LP norm and then you have to adjust the powers on the outside to make it all work right. This is what you get. So what was our left-hand side? Our left-hand side was the LP norm of the maximal operator to the peak power. So you divide through, divide both sides by the LP norm of the maximal operator to the P minus one. And you get that the LP norm of the maximal operator is less than or equal to one plus epsilon p prime. Take the supremum over n because you can. And then this term here has been divided out. Magic. And it's true for all epsilon greater than zero. So you're done. Also a nice proof. One of these nice techniques where instead of estimating an LP norm directly, you estimate its peak power and you see the same thing appear on the right hand side, but with one power less and then you divide three by it and it's a bit of magic. We have a, a minute or two left. So let me just mention a corollary unless anybody has questions about the proof. Now's your chance. Okay. Important corollary, if you take the X valued Martingale, which is after all what we care about with respect to some filtration, then you apply the pre this result to the Martingale associated, well, to this Martingale, you get that the maximal operator in the space L1 infinity is the, the weak L1 space or the Lorentz space L1 infinity. By definition, this is the supremum that we had before. In case you didn't know what that norm was, this is exactly what it is. Is less than or equal to the supremum over N of the norm of Fn. So what we proved, proved before for a general real valued sub Martingale, we're applying it to the the sub martingale given by the norm of this martingale. And for all p greater than one, you have an LP norm estimate. With the Bochner norm here. And in particular, if your martingale is a martingale coming from a function and a filtration, a dupe martingale, then you can rewrite all of this in a more convenient way. This supremum over N or these two suprema over N are controlled by the LP norms of the function F itself because conditional expectations are non-expansive on LP.
and you have the LP norm estimate, of course. P prime F in LP. Good. And this is the result we're going to use after the break. <laughs>